so that's my title, um, and I'm going to talk very generally about what the future for treating brain disorders might be. So this is the outline of my talk. Uh, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about Innovate UK, and before the introduction, can I just ask who in the audience had even heard of Innovate UK? Wow, that is a very pleasing number of people. And I can tell you, when I started this job three years ago, there were virtually no hands going up in the auditorium. Well, this is good news. After I've done a little bit on Innovate UK, I'm going to talk about developing medicines for brain disorders because that's what I have spent most of my working life doing. And I'll talk about some of the technologies that we've used in the past. Well, it'll be the past to many people in the room. It was actually the present day when I was doing it. Um, what we've learned now, some of the new technologies we have, and some ideas for the future. So first of all, a little bit about Innovate UK. It is the UK government's innovation agency. If you don't come from the UK, it is one of the most important innovation agencies. And since I've been in the job, I'd like to tell you that our budget has gone from 500 million to 1.2 billion. That's how successful we've been. So we fund businesses in the way that the research councils like the MRC or the EPSRC fund researchers in universities. We fund research and innovation in business. And the reason we do that and the reason that the government wants to spend so much money on it is, it beca is because it grows companies and it provides economic growth and jobs and it keeps uh, the company the country in business. So we provide grants and they're always based on new ideas, new technologies, and we fund a lot of new startups. So far, we've funded 8,000 companies in the 10 years that Innovate UK has been going, and I might highlight just one or two of those as I go through. We also support and fund the catapult centres. The next question, hands up if you've ever heard of a catapult centre. Fewer, but still significant. Thank you. So the Two in the um, biomedical space are the Cell and Gene Therapy Catapult Centre, which where I was this morning, because it's the launch of the new manufacturing centre there. So the government has put uh, additional funding into helping businesses scale up and produce cells, either for therapy or as tools and technologies. Um, and it was a big day because we had the Secretary of State there unveiling the plaque, all very exciting. Um, and the second one is the Medicines Discovery Catapult Centre, which is near Manchester. Now, Innovate UK funds all types of technologies, everything from graphene to the automotive sector to biomedical to quantum technology, everything. We have to cover the entire gamut of new science. But the good news is about 25% of the funding goes to life sciences. And actually, if you look at the the money that's spent in research and development across all sectors in the UK, life sciences is the highest. We have a very vibrant life science, uh, life science sector in the UK. Innovate UK also leads on the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund, partnering with the research councils. And I'm just going to tell you a bit about that. So the next question, I think the numbers will be going down now. This is the government's industrial strategy launched in November of last year. Raise your hand if you knew about this or have read it. Yes, I thought so. We're really getting down to single digits now. So I'm going to tell you just a little bit about it for the others that haven't. This is the most exciting thing for businesses and researchers in the UK. So in the industrial strategy, the government has laid out five foundations and for us, the most important element of that is ideas. And they, they say ideas, but what they really mean is research and innovation in areas that are going to be absolutely critical in the future. And these are the four grand challenge idea areas. So clean growth, and secondly, the aging society, quite broadly, then uh, artificial intelligence and the data economy, and then the future of mobility. And the aging society, really covers an awful lot. At the moment, there are 100,000 people in the UK that have reached the age of 100. There are alive 10 million people who, unless something bad happens in the future that we don't know about, are predicted to reach the age of 100. The demographics of the ageing population is a massive challenge for the UK and actually for most parts of the world. 
So what are we going to do about it? How will government funding help us meet some of the challenges of the ageing population? So the ageing society is the challenge area. The challenge fund is a fund that Innovate UK, in partnership with the research councils, provides to businesses and, and researchers to work together to solve some of the challenges that we're facing. So the challenges must address an important part of that societal issue and they must create economic growth. And so far, there are 11 challenges and three of those are in the healthcare area. So these are the three challenges. 188 million is being put towards manufacturing uh, medicines technologies. So that's not just the traditional small molecules. It's things like vaccines. It's things like how to manufacture cells for cell therapy and how to use them in advanced therapy treatment centers. And there's additional funding there for small and medium-sized enterprises to work on digital health care. The second area in the second wave, which was announced earlier this year, was uh, to improve the data that we have that can be used for early diagnosis and precision medicine. And that will include the sequencing of the UK Biobank, which at the moment is half a million people, um, and there's a, a large number of samples in there. And the second part of that is automated pathology and radiology to speed up diagnosis. The third area is specifically to develop technology and products to help people maintain independence as they grow older. And one of the recent events, if you're not familiar with it, is the formation of UK Research and Innovation, which brings all the research councils and Innovate UK together. And when we look at challenges like healthy ageing, this is not a challenge that any one council or any one area can solve. So we have to work together to solve this challenge. So here we have people like ESRC, social research, um, epidemiology research, medical research, business funding, all working together to try and develop a technology or products that will allow us to look after maybe 10,000 people using one system um, to keep them well managed as they age, incredibly important uh, for patients with Alzheimer's disease, for example. Now, the third wave, um, the calls for the challenge areas there has just closed, so I can't tell you any more about that for the moment, but I'm really hopeful there will be additional uh, biomedical challenges in uh, wave three. The fundamental question you have to ask is, with all of this additional funding, in the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund, getting on for £2 billion uh, pounds more, why is the government spending so much money on research and innovation? I ask this in a rhetorical way, but if you're a scientific researcher, it is not because the government loves research. What the government actually cares about is the economy of the country and looking after the people in the country in the most economical way. So this is about growing businesses, producing products that people need and understand, and making sure that we are resilient in the future. As I said, Innovate UK covers all areas, and in most areas of science, 10 years of research delivers great new products. Products that are made in factories, employ people, are exported, uh, create GDP for the country, and here are just three that I've been particularly close to. So this is the UK's autonomous pod that was first built at the um, Transport Systems Catapult, and it's there as a demonstrator to integrate technologies from all different places. So Oxbotica is a small company that does all the artificial intelligence on integrating um, where the positioning of the car in the road, licensed to many other car making uh, manufacturers. So that was something that was funded through us. This is a shadow robot, a hand that can, is being developed to do some very fine tasks like picking strawberries, because it may be that we need more automated ways of looking after our agricultural sector in the future. And this here is specific, so this is, um, uh, specific is the name of the organisation that's developed this classroom, which is energy positive. 
It doesn't require any, any energy to run it. You can actually charge your car off it. It is entirely self-sustaining and it uses 20, 26 different technologies, all generated in the UK, integrated into a classroom and it's completely standalone. And they're now working with companies in India to perfect it for other parts of the world. So 10 years of research, you can do some pretty amazing things. But that is not true in healthcare. In healthcare, the goal here is to prevent, treat, or cure disease. That's why we do research. We want, to, it, we want it to benefit patients. We want it to benefit the economy. But in neuroscience in particular, 10 years of research has never provided a new drug. And I'm going to tell you some more about that. Um, but it has provided new, new tools, new tools to develop new medicines. And while some of the content of my talk might sound a little downbeat, I am fundamentally an optimist. And I think that the money spent on research and what we've learned in the last few decades is really positioning us well to accelerate the delivery of new medicines. So I'm gonna talk about the decades that I know and understand. So the decade of molecular biology, which was then followed up by the decade of genetically validated targets, followed up by stem cells. I've worked a lot in stem cells, and again, I think that's brought new technology for creating new medicines. And now, we're looking to a future where it's about data, digital, and augmented and virtual realities. And they have a role to play in making medicines too. So I think uh, my thesis here is that we are moving towards a position where it will be much easier to create new medicines in a more effective way. The economic cost of brain disorders is huge. The reason we need to do this is because economically we cannot sustain ourselves where we are. What I'm showing you here is years lost due to ill life, ill health, disability or early death, what's commonly called um, daily, daily adjusted life years. So as a percentage, neuropsychiatric disorders is the largest percentage of years lost due to ill health, disability or early death, 28%. And the ageing population is making that worse. And uh, WHO has identified depression as the greatest cause of disability in the world. And this is a sadder state of affairs than it is for many other areas. So I think if you, if you just look at the drugs that have been approved, if you look at the FDA website for approvals over the last 10 years, you can see huge improvements in cancer. You can see huge improvements in um, respiratory, and you can see huge improvements in um, some areas of uh, cardiovascular and immune disorders in particular. That is not true of neuroscience. There are still relatively few new drugs in neuroscience. This is where we were in the 1980s, and these drugs were largely, and I'm making some very general comments here, largely developed through the use of animal models. They're pretty blunt mechanisms when they were first identified. How much more did we have 20 years later? Actually, we had some, some additional drugs, uh, SSRIs, SNRIs, pregabalin, so actually it was pretty, a pretty fertile time for depression, and there were some improvements of the orig original mechanisms for schizophrenia, ACE inhibitors uh, for Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, some improvements, one drug for stroke, TPA, there have been 96 failed clinical trials in stroke, and TPA is still the only decent marketed drug for stroke. Uh, epilepsy, we've had some nice new channel blockers and some uh, new molecules in pain. And what is likely to come by 2020? If, if again you look in the FDA um, website or at clinicaltrials.gov, you can see the molecules that are late in clinical development. I've put in brackets, new mechanisms that could potentially make it, um, but there's really only three new mechanisms and a few others that could potentially make it in the last 20 years. It's not a fantastic scorecard. So why? Why is it so hard to create a new drug? My next question, who in the audience is working on making a medicine? Not the basic research part, actually making a medicine. Pretty good. It's still quite a small proportion of the audience, though. Single digits, I would say. 
So this is why it's so hard. First of all, you have to find the target. And we have a lot better tools now to help us do that. We've got some great opportunity to look at disease mechanism and to use human genomics, human genetics. Um, we can make better molecular and cellular tools. And actually, when we look at animal validation, which has always been important, the availability of knockout mice, very easy, can still help us. But I would say, by and large, this is a decade of endeavour to know that you have a really good drug target. A beta, how long before we knew that was a really good drug target? John Hardy. Well, let's argue about it, but I would say, I would say 28 years. 28 years. So this is not a quick endeavour, and it's only the first part of a three-part journey. The next thing you need to do, once you have the target, is find the molecule, um, the lead, and then optimise it. And to go from here to here is not easy. For example, base, really great target for Alzheimer's disease. That, uh, that enzyme has an active site that looks pretty much like a flat sheet of paper. Really difficult to make a subtype selective molecule uh, for something like base. And it has taken years and years of work in pharmaceutical companies to develop those molecules and get them into clinical trials, and then they have not been met with success. So I'm calling this five years, but that's optimistic in some cases, and that only gets you to the point that you have a molecule that gets into people, has a reasonable half-life, is safe and well-tolerated, and then can go into clinical trials. And this, I would say, can take from five years to forever, or never. Um, but until you get into people, you really don't know very much at all. That's how long it takes. Another point to make here is that once you find your molecule somewhere in here and file your patent, you have 25 years to make a profit. And so if this takes 25 years, the patent could easily have expired by the time you start getting any money back. This is not a helpful thing. So let me give you a few stories. First of all, a classic example, and I say it's classic because it's the one I've worked on uh, for many years. So this is how to make a subtype selective benzodiazepine drug. So benzodiazepines like Valium have been around for decades. They were discovered in animal models. And then in the 80s, once we were able to clone, put, uh, put genes in cell lines, separate out all of the different um, uh, the, or the different subunits that are involved in GABA receptors, we cloned, we and others, cloned all of these subunits, worked out what the conformations of these things were and which ones bind benzodiazepines. And there are really only four subtypes that bind benzodiazepines. And that, I would say, was about 10 years' work. After that, we made subtype selective compounds against some of the subtypes. And the job here was to try and separate out the different effects of benzodiazepines. So what do they do? Valium works in anxiety, and we, we proved that with a small molecule in three different animal models. An animal model of uh, mice exploring a, a new environment, a plus maze where we put the mice on a, an elevated platform, and then fear potentiated startle, another classic uh, model where Animals jump, and people jump. If you're less anxious, you jump less. That is measurable. And we tracked that down to the alpha-2-3 subtype using uh, genetically modified mice and a selective molecule. Somnolence, the sleep-inducing effects of benzodiazepines, is mediated through the alpha-1 subtype. Aha, we thought. We can make a molecule that is useful in anxiety and doesn't make people go to sleep. That would be very useful. We also knew that the alpha-2-3 subtype is very important for treating epilepsy, as benzodiazepines are. Then there were some additional um, properties that benzodiazepines have. First of all, they uh, potentiate the effect of ethanol. I'm not suggesting you try this, but if you take a benzodiazepine and a very small dose of ethanol, you will hugely exacerbate the effect of the ethanol, and it will probably knock you out, and that is the fundamental principle behind um, a lot of um, misuse of drugs in uh, unpleasant circumstances, and I don't think we'll go into that anymore. The last um, 
the last property of benzodiazepines is they impair cognition. So people who take benzodiazepines for even a relatively short period of time can have episodes where they just don't remember what happened uh, while they were under the influence of the benzodiazepine. So an agonist benzodiazepine impairs cognition. Aha, we thought, if you can impair cognition with an agonist, can you make the inverse of an agonist, which you can at an ion channel, and could that improve cognition? Uh, and then there's some additional uh, properties, dependence and abuse potential, that are much less easy to test in these models. Um, so the hypothesis here is that we could create an alpha-2-3 selective molecule to treat anxiety and an alpha-5 inverse agonist to enhance cognition. And this uh, front cover of Nature Neuroscience in June 2000 was probably the highlight of my personal early career, and it was 10 years' work by my group that at the time was, was you know, 25 people, and we were pretty damn excited when we got that. Now, is there anybody in the audience that knows what's wrong with this picture? This is a white mouse. Transgenic mice are generally not white. They're black six, aren't they? So they're some kind of hybrid, but we took this picture of the mouse weaving its way through a molecule of diazepam because that's what nature said they would like to have on the cover. So that's what we gave them. And, and you can't actually see all of the people uh, standing outside of that trying to get just that picture. But it was a really exciting moment. So, so you're going to ask, what happened to those molecules? Did they actually work? So in clinical studies, we did what we set out to do. We made an alpha-5 inverse agonist that in rats enhanced cognition. This molecule, MRK016, we had a massive publications out of this. It was hugely exciting. And then we took this molecule into man, and in normal volunteers, the maximum dose that people could tolerate was 5 milligrams. And that we calculated from our fMRI studies occupied 75% of the receptors. 10 milligrams caused lightheadedness, tingling, dizziness, they were serious side effects. However, when we gave it to the elderly, it was very much worse. And actually, they could only tolerate half a milligram, 10% occupancy, and we really couldn't do any cognition study at all with that molecule. Because for most of the 24-hour period, there just wasn't enough receptor occupancy to be worth considering. So how about our alpha-2-3 molecule? Was that any better? We made a molecule that was non-sedating and anxiolytic in rats and also in primates, MK409. In man, we managed to get receptor occupancy at the minute dose of one milligram. But in our PET studies, that showed us we only had 10% occupancy. So here's the placebo. When we give the uh, volunteers Merck 409, there's really not much reduction in the signal. Uh, and the animals, these are at two different time points. And what happened in these patients was they fell asleep. So our original hypothesis that the alpha-2-3 selective molecule would be anxiolytic and not sedating just did not hold up, and the animal studies didn't predict man. And that is 15 years' work by 100 people and many, many millions of dollars. But all is not lost. Just this year, 40 years after the original hypothesis, 25 years later from our first uh, study, a group at Pfizer, and coincidentally I moved from Merck to Pfizer, a group at Pfizer created a different molecule, PF, uh, we call it 2865, just published this year, and it has high efficacy at alpha-2, and in man, we are able to get up to 90% receptor occupancy with no sedation. And here is the fMRI pictures where you can see great signal with flumazenil and virtually blocked at the early time point, some recovery at the next uh, time. So we now have a molecule um, just published this year that proves the hypothesis was correct, but it took decades. Yeah. Down the well, so this is the exciting thing, in a way. 
Pfizer closed their neuroscience, but this is one of the molecules that they are trying to set up um, a partnership, a collaboration, or spin out to an organization that might develop it. So I think there are something like half a dozen assets of which I would say this is absolutely the best one in the bunch uh, that could still be developed. So very exciting. So GABA, 40 years and counting. What came next? Genomics and stem cells. So let's talk a bit about identifying new drug targets using genetics and genomics. And people here, I think, will be familiar because this is, this is what this audience knows about. You can look at rare, uh, in rare alleles, um, so-called Mendelian disease, or common variants. Uh, these have much smaller effects. These have much larger effects. Or you can look at low-frequency alleles that are... Um, really at the extreme of uh, subjects when you look at the distribution of, of a set of properties. And the example I'm going to talk about is one of these, one of these rare Mendelian alleles. Um, and this is a, one of a, a group of ion channel targets that I worked on, my, my team at Pfizer worked on. And um, this is the SCN9A is the gene, a sodium channel, NAV1.7 is the gene product. And there are some rare and very serious uh, disorders that are linked to this gene. In patients who have a gain of function mutation, they have what's called um, uh, erythromyalgia. So these are very rare. There are only a few families um, in the world. And what happens is they're reasonably comfortable at ambient temperatures. When it gets a bit warm, they have the sense that their flesh is on fire. It is extremely painful. These people rarely go out and they sit in front of a cooling fan for most of their lives. Actually, suicide is not uncommon in these families. So that is the gain of function mutation where the channel is constitutively active pretty much. This is the loss of function mutation. And you might think if you uh, have no functioning sodium channel and you don't feel pain, this would be a good thing. These are the hands of a small child who can feel no pain and essentially chewed her fingers off. So we have here a gain of function mutation and a loss of function mutation. And in fact, now we know there are at least 25 different types of mutations in the sodium channel. Not all have been characterized. Now, when I started Pfizer Nucentis, we thought it would be a great wheeze to do a deal with 23andMe and see if we could find some new um, targets for pain big data approach. So Pfizer sent a questionnaire out through 23andMe with a lot of questions about the sorts of pain that you experienced, the drugs that you took, and we looked to see, I think we had oh, tens of thousands of responses, we looked to see whether we could find any linkage with a specific um, gene. We did find one thing, not hugely useful for pain, but we found one thing. Is there anybody in the room who doesn't cry when they cut onions? You should try this. Yeah, OK, we have a couple. Now, the reason you don't cry when you cut onions is because you have a specific mutation in one of your trip channels. That's what we found from a very large amount of money going to 23andMe and a very big study. We didn't find anything for pain, but we know why you don't cry if you uh, cut onions. The great thing, though, about having patients with an autosomal um, dominant gene that drives their pain phenotype is that we could take um, cells from them, turn them into um, sensory neurons by making iPS cells and then differentiating them. And having worked on iPS cells, we were able to recapitulate the action potentials and the calcium waves and really recapitulate most of the physiology of a sensory neuron including things like calcium waves and calcium networking in sensory neurons from iPS cells. So we thought, why don't we make the iPS cells from the patients and see what they respond to? So we did. So we were able to, working with Steve Waxman at Yale, track down some of the patients that had this rare problem. And what we found when we turned them into sensory neurons is that compared with normal donors, a lot more of the erythromyalgia patients had spontaneously active sensory neurons. And in order to get the cells to fire, they required much lower injection of current 
than the normal donors. And even better, the NAV 1.7 blocker that we made blocked the channels from the erythromyalgia patients. And what we found then was that those patients required much higher uh, currents to be injected to get them to fire than the normal donors did. So this is all looking quite interesting. So what happened when we gave the drug to the patients? We ran a clinical trial with just five patients. Uh, this is the characterization of the five patients. Quite interesting, they, even though it's a mutation in the same uh, gene, they don't have all quite the same phenotype. And in fact, EM1 was a, a much milder phenotype than the others. Um, so they, they had their, their pain drugs removed. And then because they, uh, they need heat to um, spark off an attack, we developed a device that was a um, water going through like a blanket that could be wrapped around an extremity that we could turn and off and on very quickly, and we could even cool it. So if they were in terrible pain, we could reduce the temperature around the extremity. And we gave them uh, two trial periods, either with placebo or with 771, the drug. And you can see here, with very low concentrations of the drug, not much difference um, from placebo. And at, at four hours, um, there's a, a two-unit drop in their pain score. This is a zero to 10 um, pain score, which they rate every 15 minutes. And um, that was sustained at eight to nine hours, and that was statistically significant with only five patients. Hurrah, you might think. We have made a sodium channel blocker that works in pain. We also put this molecule into a broad population of uh, people undergoing dental surgery. And patients with erythromyalgia do not feel pain when they have uh, dent dental work done. When we gave it to a broader population of people, virtually did nothing. So there was another 20 years of work without having delivered a drug. Now, there are still people working on sodium channels, and there are many reasons why that molecule may not have worked. So I don't think it's all over yet. So NAV 1.7, 20 years and still going. What's next over the horizon? Machine learning and artificial intelligence. I think that is the forefront of where we are today. So now I want to talk to you about using artificial intelligence and machine learning. Let's talk a bit about depression. So digital phenotyping. When you use your mobile phone, you do many things that are characteristic to you, characteristic to your mood, and actually that information can be collected, analysed, and used to understand something about your mood, your state of mind, and your health. And there's a company, MindStrong, led by Tom Insull, and this is exactly what this company is doing in a much more ethical way than many other companies who are using uh, information from your phone and your social networks. So that's one approach. The second approach is online cognitive behavioral therapy. You can have behavioral therapy one-to-one -one with your therapist. Actually, there's a lot of information now that, particularly for young people, doing this online in a digital way is just as effective and additional information can be collected that can be used to do machine learning and um, learn something about what works and what doesn't work. And the third one, which we're going to explore in a little more detail, is diagnosing depression and improving treatments using algorithms based on human emotional responding. And this, the company that has done this work is pivotal, and I have to give you a disclosure here. Many of the people that work in this company were my original colleagues at, at Merck many years ago. Uh, one of them is, in fact, my husband. So just so that you know. Um, now, the premise here is when you meet somebody for the first time, when you talk to them, you very quickly make decisions about what they're like. So here, this is a, what you're seeing here is a face that's going from neutral to happy. And at some point during that transition, you'll make the decision about how you're going to interact with this person. This is virtually automatic emotional processing. And the relevance of that is that people who are depressed are less able to recognize happiness in the face of somebody else. This is work that was done by Catherine Harmer um, well, quite a few years ago now, and the work's been evolving since. So what you can see here these are healthy controls. Depressed patients recognize happiness less. When effectively treated with an antidepressant, that improves. And the important point here is the ability to recognize happiness or changes in emotional processing precedes the effect 
of the antidepressant as recognised by the patient. So it takes six, eight, ten weeks maybe for antidepressants to work, but an improvement in recognising uh, the mood of others happens generally uh, round about a week. So this is where we are going to do some serious audience participation. There are ten emotions here, and you'll see they all go from neutral to um, the, the furthest expression of that emotion by the model. And these are all uh, elements of mood that are important in, in depression. And they can be broken down into those, uh, those, different, um, those different moods, and you can recognise very quickly what the mood is. So the task that's used in this um, study that led to the machine learning is you're going to see a face, it will be shown to you really quickly, very quickly, and when you see it, I want you to shout out what the mood was. So was it anger, was it fear, was it happy, sad? Are you ready? It's going to be very quick. Happy. I'm going to do another one. Remember, it's going to be very quick. You're good at this. <laughs> right, here's the third one. Ready? Ah, not so easy. That one is 50% fear. 50% fear. So, what this study does is looks at negative emotional bias. It goes from neutral to fear. And I showed you the face that was halfway in the middle, and it was difficult for you to decide what it was. And this is why. For most people, to perceive fear, you have to be quite a long way up the scale. And that sort of face would be perceived as fear by a healthy person who doesn't have depression. Now, for somebody who does have major depression before drug treatment, they would see quite a neutral face as fearful. And that is what we describe as a negative emotional bias. After treatment, this sort of face would be perceived as fear by a patient with depression after they've been treated, but before they would tell you that they feel well. And so the reduced negative emotional bias is what's measured in this study. So, funded by Innovate UK, before I was the chief executive, before I worked there, um, Pivotal did this very early study looking at just 58 patients. And what they were looking at was whether citalopram improved the mood and whether they could see how the, how the mood was changing. And they used facial, facial emotional recognition task and an inventory of depression, a self-reported scale, and based on those 58 patients, developed a machine learning algorithm to predict the individual response, which has an accuracy of 74%. And now they have a much larger phase two study underway. And you can see the benefits here. Because if we're able to understand at a week if the medicine's going to work, you can either um, keep the dose, change the dose, change the medicine, or with a larger population, link the patient with the medicine that works best. This is machine learning to, to drive precision medicine, better diagnosis and optimal treatment. And it's not just in depression that machine learning is becoming much more uh, useful. So Epilepsy, again, Innovate UK has funded both of these companies. Um, Shearwater Systems and actually working with MyCareCentric have developed an app that integrates wearable technology and measures seizures, heart rate, skin response, sleep patterns, and particularly what are the triggers for the epileptic fits? And already they've shown improved outcomes in response times, improved uh, reduction in hospital visits, and improved welfare for patients. Um, again, in stroke, patient stratification is really important. Who's going to benefit from endovascular treatment? Brainomics is another company Innovate UK supported. And actually in the States, this company, VizAI, just this year got approval for a similar platform which uses AI to tell clinicians should this patient have which type of uh, stroke treatment. Should they have TPA? Should they have a thrombectomy? 
And also, just last year, for schizophrenia, a drug in partnership with a digital sensor that tracks whether patients have taken their medications. So where are we now and what can we see in the future? This is the same table that I showed you earlier. What's coming down the track? Devices for Parkinson's disease, uh, we can expect to see improving um, L-DOPA and the, the dose and the, the um, peak to trough uh, L-DOPA levels. Thrombectomy, not a drug, but an intervention for stroke. And I've just put here some of the things that we've talked about. I haven't talked about immune, immune therapy and, and uh, neuro, neuroinflammation, which is becoming um, much more relevant in uh, some of what we thought were psychiatric disorders or actually immunological disorders. I haven't also talked about virtual reality for managing um, schizophrenia. And University College, for example, has got some really exciting work on using uh, virtual reality for managing autism. Uh, vaccination for Alzheimer's disease, this may come up later on. And then again, precision diagnosis for stroke um, and for epilepsy, and some really exciting stuff on epilepsy, again, using the same stem cell type approaches I've talked about and the digital management of the patients. So some predictions. Here are my predictions for the future in my last few minutes. First of all, Developing treatment for brain disorders is going to require more coordinated interdisciplinary research. That is absolutely standard. And the formation of UK Research and Innovation, which puts all of the research councils in one organisation, will make that much easier in the UK. I think there are only two countries in the world where all of their research councils are within one organisation that can move funds from one part to the other. It's the UK and Iceland. Iceland is so small that it can only have one organisation. The UK has done it because it believes that's the future. We had a bill passed in Parliament last year and this new organisation uh, was formed on the 3rd of April this year. My second prediction, new, tra new treatment paradigms will come from patient phenotype based on real world data. I think nobody would argue with that one. And that the technologies developed in the last year are really a precursor and a necessary part to accelerate the delivery of precision medicines. We're going to see a lot more combinations of drugs with digital technologies. And I also can see that AI and virtual reality will open up new avenues for prevention, treatment and management of brain disorders. So I think the future is rosy, actually. It has been very difficult to make medicines. But... The amount of research that has been done is making this immeasurably easier. It's very easy to come up with some predictions for the future, but the best way to predict the future is to create it. And that's why you are all here, because you will be creating the future. My last slide, a few acknowledgements. This does not do justice to the number of people that I've worked with over the years and, and the people that are on some of these papers. I just particularly want to pick out some of the Merck team, some of my team at Nucentis, which was our Pfizer unit, now closed, my colleagues at Innovate UK and some of my colleagues um, at Pivotal. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. So we've got time for a few questions. John. Just, uh, I was interested by your anxiety and GABA um, uh, example. What was different, I mean, because of course, we, we of course are trying amyloid drugs and it's, they're failing and, and you tried GABA drugs and they failed and now Pfizer came along, I'm saying 15 years later and apparently the same strategy worked. What was different? Yes, I was hoping I wasn't going to get asked that question. Um, so, truthfully, we don't totally know. They were different assays. It may have been that our uh, initial cell-based assays um, didn't accurately predict what zero activity is. These are not binding selective. They're functionally selective molecules. They all bind, but they have different levels of efficacy. And actually when you only need, with Valium, 5% occupancy of the receptor to see quite an anxiolytic effect, a really tiny uh, level of efficacy might be all that's required to produce sedation. So the, when we were at Pfizer, the assays that were developed there could have been more useful. It could be that the drugs interacting with the ion channel in a subtly different way. Um, there are many hypothetical reasons 
but we have no real evidence because there's no side-by-side -side comparison that could be done. Two different groups, 10 years apart. Well, they're not completely different groups. Some of the people from the first group strangely moved to Pfizer and worked in, on GABA in the second company. But we don't fully understand it, John. So it seems like a lot of things fail because they don't translate from small animals to, yeah. to humans. So how do we get around that one? I mean, you think that working with human stem cells as having a human <coughs> model, even though it's not yeah. an animal, is, it seems like we, need, we still need animals because we still need physiology, right? It's not yes. good enough just to have a cell system. Well, and so. I, I would look at it slightly differently. I would say that whole column of drugs that we had in the 1980s were all developed using animal models, largely. Mm. And that got us so far. And to refine the treatment, we've now had to use different technologies, and I think human stem cells are one of them. There's many reasons. Even when you do a straightforward binding assay, you can see the rat doesn't always translate in affinity or efficacy to the human. So we do need the human cell models, but we'll never, in my view, we'll never be able to avoid animal experiments. You can't measure blood pressure in an iPS cell, and that's just, that's just the way of it. So um, I, I, would, I would say that the animal models took us as far as they could because these are very blunt tools. And the refined um, genetics, genomics, stem cell research takes us further. Real-world data on large populations to define which patients need which drug will be the next step. So I just think it's a sequential learning, sequential science. Hi, great talk, thank you. I was curious as a young researcher, I feel like one of, the, uh, one of the major needs that we need to identify is biomarkers. So I was wondering whether there is a con concerted effort from the government and also from in with industries and basic um, academic departments to really develop biomarkers, especially for neurodegenerative diseases. Yes, yeah, so I could have done that whole talk on biomarkers rather than drugs. So clearly biomarkers are really critical, biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease, biomarkers for depression, and actually, even just the test that you thank, thank you all very much for joining in, the test that you did there, the emotional um, response, that is essentially a biomarker for depression. If you can't judge um, emotions in other people, that is a biomarker for somebody who's depressed. And those things help dramatically, dramatically. I, I just think that we can't be... Um, we can't be too careful in the generation of biomarkers. It's very easy to develop things that you think are fundamental to the disease, but then turn up in many other places. And, and particularly in neuroscience, when you think of the number of genes that each contribute a very small amount to the disorder or contribute to multiple different disorders, it makes it really very difficult. That's one of the reasons why neuroscience is the most challenging. On the other side, using artificial intelligence and reasoning and analysis is much more relevant for mental health than it is for some other indications. You couldn't do cognitive behavioural therapy in cancer. Last question over here. Um, I, I thank you very much. Interest, very interesting, exciting talk, basically. But uh, I was surprised that you didn't mention uh, the um, nucle and oligonucleotide therapy for... Uh, Neuro neurological disorder with oh, nursing, yes, I nursing could have put that and in, so yeah. on. No, you're right. An omission, thank you. Yes, and there there is one just now approved, isn't there? Yeah, they are now approved. Well, yeah, there is one just now approved, so I should have had that in there. Thank you. Okay, I think probably in the interest of time we should move on, but uh, uh, once again, I think we should thank Ruth for her, her great talk.